Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So it's been a little bit of time since I last filmed a video. As you might have seen um, on my Instagram, on Twitter, I've mentioned that um, last week I had to send off my MacBook to get a battery repair, uh, which has meant that I've not been able to film anything and upload anything for about a week. So I'm really, really sorry for the delay there with videos. We're all sorted now. Um, it was, like I say, meant to be just a battery repair. It pretty much seems as if Apple have sent me an entire new laptop like I am not sure from the, the description on the letter that they sent me what they've actually kept from the original model you know uh, so yeah had a bit of a had a bit of a mare yesterday trying to get everything back that had basically been wiped from my laptop also last week I had a little bit of a sore throat nothing serious just like my regular sore throat that I always seem to get like before I've got a show not got a show this time I guess instead uh, what I've ended up missing is filming time but no I am back today to do a slightly belated August wrap up part two of all of the books that I read in the second half of August 2020. Now, as I've mentioned in my part one wrap up, my reading pace has seemed to slow down a little bit. It's something that I'm not overly, overly worried about, but you know, I like to keep an eye on things because I do occasionally get that bit of reader's guilt, that little bit of reader FOMO where I'm just thinking, God, there are so many books that I want to read, so many books in the universe and I'm never gonna have time to read them all. So every single time that I do go into a slightly slower reading month, I just feel like, what am I doing with my life? August was also the first time that I went into a bookshop for the first time since March. And I feel like being able to see these like shelves upon shelves of books books that I know, I'm never going to get around to reading all of them. I think it really just reinforced how many books there are and how little time there is to read them. Like just in the history non-fiction section alone, I was just like, there are so many things I'm never going to read. So when you factor in like classics, poetry, other non-fiction, and just fantasy, sci-fi, everything, all of the different genres, you just feel like, uh, uh, just a bit overwhelmed. It's a lot. It's a lot. And I have to be really careful about getting into that kind of mindset of, oh, I'm such a failure, I'm not gonna read everything because that's exactly the kind of all or nothing uh, kind of lane that I am very likely to go down. And it's probably the reason that I went into a reading slump back in my teenage years in the first place. And so I need to be careful and monitor that and not go too crazy and stop beating myself up about not being able to read everything. So, you know, positive thoughts and affirmations, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, that kind of thing. <laughs> But yeah, it's been a, an interesting bunch of books that I've read this month, kind of a little varied mix. I've had a bit of everything and a bit of an up and down in terms of what I've liked and what I've not really liked. So to start off, we will talk about a book that I mentioned I was reading at the end of my August wrap up part one, and that is Queens of the Conquest, the extraordinary women who changed the course of English history from 1066 to 1167. This is a biography by Alison Weir, which recounts the life of the early medieval Queens of England. So in this, we are following Matilda of Flanders, who was the wife of Henry I, Matilda of Scotland and Adeliza of Louvain, who were the wives of Henry I, Matilda of Boulogne, who was the wife of King Stephen, and then finally we look at Empress Matilda, who was never actually crowned as a queen in her own right, but as we know, she should have been. And yeah, I found this to be a pretty solid biography of these four queens. I think it was really well researched and I'll definitely be wanting to continue with the rest of Alison Weir's series. She's doing this as part of her England's Medieval Queen series and I think this is going to be one of four. I think I found the first section of this book to be the strongest where we're talking about Matilda Flanders and particularly her relationship to William I. You really get the sense of their relationship being a, a mix of two people who are very loving but very, very strong-willed. She mixes in a lot of myth that is surrounding uh, William and Matilda and also some of the factual evidence and I think that makes it a much more well-rounded portrait of these two people and really really highlights how limited the amount of sources that we have from this period really is. You know in some instances like we can't definitively pin down some of their children and it's like these were the children of the king and queen of England. Like, how do we not know things about them, particularly about the daughters? Like I say, there's some really kind of wild um, mythology surrounding Matilda and William, particularly in their courtship. The famous story concerning Matilda and William comes in the fact that uh, William had initially made his offer of marriage to her father, and he presented um, William as a as a candidate, as a suitor, and Matilda was like, no, nah, I'm not really interested in him. Nah, 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 he, he's, he, nah, don't like him. And then apparently William came to the garden that she was staying at and beat her up and then 
when everybody was like absolutely scandalized and outraged at the fact that he had beat up this woman for not marrying him, Matilda apparently had a change of heart and was like, actually, the fact that he beat me up shows that he really does care about me and what a forceful man he is and what a pr man to be reckoned with. And you're just kind of like, but apparently after that, she was like, yes, that is the man for me. He's a man who really knows how to make his point. What the hell? What the hell? Like I say, I did have some issues with this biography. Firstly, I feel like Adeliza of Louvain, who was the second wife of Henry I, really didn't get much of a look in in this biography. Now, this is most likely due to there being a lack of sources, particularly surrounding her. She wasn't quite as active, apparently, as some of the other queens were in the day-to-day -day activities. However, you kind of feel like she's being done dirty by, because like, even in her own section, she's not really the focus. The focus is much more around the Henry the first succession question and crisis and there's a lot more focus on Stephen and Empress Matilda and their fighting. It really makes me crave a biography of Adeliza but because there's probably so little evidence for her time there we're probably never gonna get that and that's such a shame. Also as I did mention in my autumn TBR I did not love the portrayal of Empress Matilda, or Empress Maud as she refers to her. And especially after reading Catherine Hanley's biography of Empress Matilda, where she like really delved into all of these medieval sources and really tried to unpick why it was that different chroniclers were saying the things that they were about Matilda, I really felt like Alison Weir wasn't doing her due diligence in really interrogating these sources, which meant that you ended up getting a very negative portrait of Matilda because she's basically taking these chroniclers for gospel to make sure that the biography is somehow still flowing like a narrative rather than being very analytical. It just felt like there was no moment where Alison Weir like stepped back and said, hmm, why is it that these people are saying the things that they're saying? And I felt like that was so lacking. So I was kind of disappointed. And yes, maybe it is because I am Empress Matilda, fangirl extraordinaire, but I, I, I just want balance. I'm, I'm fine seeing some negative depictions of Matilda, but I feel like you have to back it up. The fact that it felt like Alison Weir was so intent on keeping these sections when it came to Empress Maud um, as, as flowing as narrative and not interrogating and not being analytical, it actually felt kind of out of sync with the rest of the biography. Like particularly for the Matilda of Flanders sections, she was really like assured in making sure you know which bit is myth and which bit is fact and what do we have the evidence for and what do we not. So the fact that Empress Matilda didn't really get a look in and like her side of the story wasn't really considered, it did feel almost as if Alison Weir didn't like Matilda so she wasn't gonna really interrogate any of those sources. However, like I say, the rest of it I still really did enjoy. Um, I think if you're wanting a whistle-stop tour into the different medieval queens, uh, definitely pick this up. I'm definitely going to be picking up the next book in the series which is Queens of the Crusades. A fiction book that I picked up this month was Expectation by Anna Hope. This is a recently published contemporary novel which is set in and around London where we are following three friends, Hannah, Kate and Lissa. We follow them from their teenage years when they first meet up to their mid 30s which is kind of like the present day because we are kind of going backwards and forwards in time with these three friends. We get to see how their friendships formed and what their young expectations of life were and then we get to see how their plans and their expectations diverged and changed not only from what they expected of themselves but also how their lives diverged and changed from each other. How that big change from what they expected out of life does a number on both their self-perceptions, but also on the, how they relate to each other as friends. What we find with these three women at the beginning of their 30s is that they are all struggling in some way. We have Kate, who is a recent mother, who is really struggling to come to terms with this big upheaval in her life. We have Hannah, who is professionally successful, but who has been trying and failing to get pregnant, and she is on her final round of the IVF and really struggling to conceive a child. We then have Lissa, who is a struggling actress, who is not particularly interested at all in settling down and having a family but is really starting to become disinterested and disheartened by the amount of professional rejection she is facing. Like I say the common theme is that all three of these women are struggling in some way and are in some way envious of what the other has and that's the book. That, 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 that is the whole book. That, that's it. Yeah, this is this is a perfectly fine book. Like it's competently written, like the, the, the point is got across, but this book didn't really wow me at all. You know, there wasn't like stunning writing. I didn't find the characterization really that special at all. And also there were some things that kind of annoyed me about it, particularly there were some certain very predictable plot points, plot beats um, that I was hoping wouldn't be hit, but 
yeah, some of these cliches would very much hit upon in this book. One in particular that right at the beginning I kind of predicted was going to happen and I was really, really hoping that she wasn't going to take the book down that particular direction, but she did and I was like, uh, great, thanks. Like I say, the writing wasn't awful at all, it was fine, but it also wasn't special. There were never like any beautiful passages here. And I didn't feel particularly drawn to any of these characters. In fact, one of them I actively despised and hated and hated every second that she was on the page. And when your book is essentially this big character focused story, I feel like that's a major flaw. Another thing that didn't bother me so much when I was reading the book, but when I was seeing other people discussing this um, and it kind of hit home for me, oh yeah, that, that's that's a bit odd, um, is the theme of childlessness in this book. The idea in this book seems to be, and I don't think this is really Anna Hope's intention, but it kind of comes across when you finish the book and you, you kind of look back on it, is this idea that childlessness is kind of seen as the worst possible thing. Like being an adult woman and not settling down and having a family is kind of seen like this big bad thing that you don't want to happen. It seems like with these three characters, the plot never allows the idea that you can have a perfectly satisfying, fulfilling life without having children. And I don't want to spoil things too much, but I feel like if you've read this, um, let me know what you thought because like I say, it didn't bother me so much when I was actually reading it, but when you kind of step back and you see like the journey that all of these characters go down and how they are kind of treated by the plot for their decision to have children or to not have children, yeah, I, I find that kind of weird, especially in this day and age, like, come on. Like, you can, you can not have children and be perfectly satisfied and happy and... Yay. Next up, we have Sophia Khan is not obliged by Aisha Malik, and guys... I really wanted to like this book, I really did. This follows Sophia Khan, who is a 30-something Muslim woman who is living in London, working in publicity in a publishing house. She is in a meeting with the rest of her publishing house and she's kind of complaining to her friends about Muslim dating when suddenly one of her bosses is like, hmm, that's a really interesting idea for a book. You should write that for us. And she is suddenly pulled into writing this book about Muslim dating that she does not want to write. And despite her very clear wish to not be in the dating game and to kind of take a step back from it, because of the fact that she's writing this book, she has to do research. So she goes on all of these dates and kind of compiles interviews with different friends and family about their experiences. And because this is a rom-com, of course, she isn't looking for love, but love finds her. This book has frequently been pegged as the Muslim Bridget Jones, which is not just me parroting like marketing jargon. This is actually something that Ayesha Malik has really claimed and has actually has referred to this book as being in the afterword. And I would say that that is fairly accurate. You know, we've got the diary entries here. We've got this kind of like hapless protagonist who's kind of a little bit of a mess, who's kind of barreling through life. She has pretty bad luck with men and some of the romantic plots within this book do kind of mirror Bridget Jones. And it was a premise that I was really excited for but unfortunately I didn't love the execution. Because this book was a diary I often felt like the the diary aspect was kind of a crutch to pad the story out. Like this is like quite a long book for what actually happens in it and you kind of have the story padded out with a lot of unnecessary boring details. Because the truth is is that I feel like this is a pretty plotless book and which is not helped at all by the character of Sophia Khan. Now Sophia is quite a contrary character. She is somebody who is very very passionate it, but she's often like kind of unmoored. She doesn't always know what she's doing and what her goal and her direction in life is. She will either do things at like 11 out of 10 or zero. She is actively bad at her job. We see from the beginning of the book there are lots of instances where she is very opinionated and assertive, but then a lot of the time she is the complete opposite and does not take any real action, which means that we spend a good chunk of this book at a complete standstill where not much is really happening because Sophia is not really actively doing anything. And I feel like it's absolutely fine for a book character to be a bit contrary, to have this journey where they're kind of going back and forth with different aspects of their personality. You know, lots of people are very contrary, but it just kind of felt like this inactivity was just a device to keep the book going to the deadline of when the book has to be handed in. You can have lots of characters who are just not really that enamoured with what they're doing and just kind of don't want to be there, but external forces force them to make action and to take action. However, a lot of this book relies on Sophia being the one to make decisions and she doesn't ever do that. Or if she does, she will make completely unmotivated choices where you're kind of like, 
why did you do that? So let's talk about this Muslim dating book that Sophia is meant to be writing. This is meant to be the big inciting incident that really kicks the plot off in motion and gets things going. However, honestly, I would argue that this book is kind of non-existent within the actual narrative of this book. And that's because Sophia Khan herself does not care about this book. Like she will actively put off writing it up until there is a deadline where she has to send in a chapter. She procrastinates doing research. She gets really annoyed with people whenever they try and talk to her about the book. And to be honest with you, I genuinely did not understand what this book was meant to be. Like what is it meant to be focusing on? There's this general idea that it's a book about Muslim dating, but we have no idea like what the end goal is like what what point are we trying to get across how is this book structured how is any of this research going to form any sort of thing that looks and resembles a book this is meant to be the big focal plot point of the book but we have no idea what this book is really about. We do get to see a little bit of the research that she's doing, of the interviews that she's conducting. We get to see little snippets of the manuscript for, that are scattered throughout the book, but all of it seems to be anecdotal. And I was just kind of left with this feeling of why have the publishers asked Sophia to write this book when she is clearly not an expert in this field of Muslim dating? And she's also clearly not interested in the book at all. But then conversely, when the plot dictates, you get moments where the book is the most important important thing ever. Like there are moments where Sophia will be complaining that her publishers want her to make edits and changes to the book to make it either more palatable or more marketable, more sellable to the public. And all the while she's kind of complaining to her diary that she wants to write a different book than her publishers want her to write. And it's like, girl, you didn't want to write a book in the first place. Like, don't act as if you've got this big vision of what this book is going to be. You have no idea what you're doing. Like, I didn't hate this book by any means. I just found it a bit of a slog to get through. And there were just some inconsistencies that I couldn't quite wrap my head around. Like, what was the purpose of this? It's not going to deter me from reading any more Aisha Malik, because I think she is a genuinely really funny writer. I think that the, there were definitely lots of moments of humour in here that kind of lifted the book up for me. And I think the real standout moments of this book came when Sophia was talking about her experiences as a Muslim woman and her interactions that she will have on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis with other people. I also found the conversations with her family to be really really great and really enjoyable to read um, but then everything else like the writing of the book, the plot, the romance plots especially, I just found really meh and boring and just like standard rom-com kind of stuff. I've also heard really really good things about this Green and Pleasant Land by Aisha Malik. Um, the plot of that just sounds really really intriguing. It sounds like all of the best bits of Sophia Khan uh, in the book. So let me know about that one because I, I, I'm not deterred from reading more Aisha Malik. It's just I didn't particularly like this story. And then finally the last book that I read in the second half of August was Mythos by Stephen Fry. This is a very very popular book which has come highly recommended by a lot of my friends. This is Stephen Fry's retelling of Greek myths. This is part of an ongoing series that he is writing and this one in particular is much more focused towards gods and goddesses and the mythology around them. You've got the formation of the world and particularly the creation of the Olympian gods, you've got the creation of humans, of Prometheus giving us the fire, we've got Pandora's jar, among many many other very famous myths and some that you may have forgotten about. And you know there are so many different Greek myth retellings out there that you're probably kind of thinking do we really need this one? Um, and I think the main selling point for this is Stephen Fry's humour because his voice and his sense of humour really really comes through in here. Stephen Fry likes to mix a lot of the traditional myth with a lot of more modern humour and a lot more modern colloquial language which is very very reminiscent to The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. Uh, if you remember I was talking about how she did kind of the same thing with the Trojan War. Well like Achilles would be like yep she'll do lads and it's kind of very similar in this book as well. For me I really enjoyed how Stephen Fry wrote these myths in this more modern way because it really emphasises that these stories are not just antique fables that have no relevance to today. There's still a lot that you can get out of them and it also goes a long way in showing just how petty and petty the gods are. However, like I mentioned with The Silence of the Girls, this is going to be a kind of writing that is not for everybody and if you are somebody who gets very hung up on anachronistic language being used in books, you will probably want to shy away from this and I'm currently reading Heroes which is the follow-up to this um, and I would say it's even more colloquial and there's, it, 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 he goes even further with it so you might want to skip that one altogether. You know, if you're expecting like flowery, lyrical, like beautiful fairy tale like Mifri 
retellings. You're not going to get that from here. Personally, I happen to really, really like Stephen Fry's sense of humour, so I knew that I was going to get on with it. What I'd probably recommend that you do is like read some of his tweets. Um, he also has a podcast that I really, really enjoy. Have a listen maybe to that because it's very, very reminiscent of what he does in here. And if you don't like it, if you don't get on with it, then I'd say skip this book. But otherwise, this was a really, really enjoyable read for me. I really particularly enjoyed how much Stephen Fry draws out just how much of our language and expressions comes from a lot of these Greek myths. And I'd also say if you're a fan of things like Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman, you'll really, really enjoy this. So this was probably the best thing that I read in the second half of this month. So highly, highly recommend. So yes, we have come to the end of all of the books that I read in the second half of August. Do let me know if you have read any of the books that I have read, what you thought about them, any differing opinions. I'm sure that I'm going to get a lot of differing opinions on things like Sophia Khan or uh, Expectation. And also, what have you read this month? Um, any books that you have to recommend for me? I'd love to hear from you. I hope that you are having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye.